Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale M4A3 E2 Jumbo Sherman tank. Since the last video update, you can see a lot of progress has been made to the model's lower hull and this did require some revisions to be made to the stock model itself. We'll be going over all these modifications, these revisions, as well as also I'm pretty sure I'm going to be pissing some people off with several of the techniques and why I went with these techniques on this build over here. So this is going to make for a fantastic video in all. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and kick this video off. To start this video off, the very first thing that I need to do before I can do anything else on this model is to give it a thorough wash. As we saw in the previous video, this thing's surface is absolutely disgusting. It's got just layers of all sorts of really nasty shop dust on it, and it would just help everybody if this was totally cleaned off. The best way to do that, low tech ways, sometimes the best way, a garden hose. Well, as it turns out, the dust is even more robust than I thought because even blasting it with the garden hose alone was not enough to get it off. So I'm just going to go ahead and drizzle some soap on it. It should be able to help with the cleansing process. Okay, so here we are at ground zero of the project. The first thing I need to do is start the revisions in order to get this whole ready to a point where I can start adding on the other details, things like the suspension, other hull fittings, you know, things along those lines. And the first thing I need to do is to prep the lower hull. You'll see that with a red Sharpie, I went ahead and marked out several locations that need to be revised. The area here in the middle where the hatches are molded on, that's going to go completely. I'm just going to cut a big unceremonious square right in this section and plunk that fellow out. On the rear section over here, this also is going to be plunked out because I need this space hollow in order I could add the, the extenders as well as also the grill work sections. The molded in sections here are also going to be eliminated. And on the top section, I'm actually going to be plating the entire piece over with a panel of material. And to do that, the entire surface needs to be as flat as possible. With the way the model is, I have certain fasteners integrally molded in. This was, These were actually used originally to hold a big panel of styrene in place. And I just used these large screws that I had on hand at the time. And uh, you know, they did the job with plating it over, but now that I'm starting the model, these need to go. So everything has been circled with the Sharpie indicating where they are so I don't miss them during the removal process. Same thing here on the side. I have some fasteners that are present. They got to go as well. On this section here, you'll notice where I have the word fill. The entire portion, I believe, is going to be plated over with, again, some material. And when I first originally built this, I didn't extend the sections long enough. So you can see where the transmission cover ends. I need to go ahead and match this section here with the lower portion of the hull. This will also help when it comes time for mounting on the suspension. I now have a wide enough area to mount the fasteners and that will help secure everything in place. Same thing is also true for the opposite side. And to do the actual revision process for the removal sections I'm going to be utilizing the Dremel Multimax. That will be perfect to plunge cut and just cut these sections out with some precision. And for the remainder of these sections over here I can either use the Multimax or I can use a palm or a belt sander. 
either one should be able to do the job just fine. However, to do a procedure like this, this specifically with this fiberglass material, this is not something I'm going to do in the shop. It will kick up way too much dust, makes a mess of the place. So this is one of those procedures that's best done outdoors. Oh, that's hot as hell. Okay, so I was able to get the panel cut out. Put a hell of a lot of wear and tear on the Multimaster, or the Multimax, I should say. Well, it would help if I had a fresh cutting blade. This one's kind of dull, but regardless, burned hands aside, I was able to get the pieces cut out. This year was pretty tricky, was, which was to be expected. I saw from the way it was molded, I knew there was gonna be a lot of material here. It's gonna be pretty thick, and it was basically solid fiberglass. In this case looks like Bondo of some sort. Regardless, the job was done. So we're gonna go ahead and clean up the remainder of the surface.
with the model outdoors, you can see how the lower hull is going to start closing up. So for the medium, I'm utilizing a quarter inch thick panel of plywood called Luon or Luvon. It's, it's used for flooring primarily is where you find it in home improvement stores. As a fun fact, the panel that you see here is repurposed from <laughs> a section of linoleum flooring that we had ripped out in our house about 20 years ago. And uh, for the last 20 years, some odd years, all the scratch builds that utilize a similar type of medium on my builds are basically repurposed wood from our old linoleum flooring. The material is great. It's really good to work with. I like the thickness being a quarter of an inch. It's nice and durable. You can nail to it. You can bolt to it. And once assembled, it gives you some very good structure. Uh, back to the topic of the linoleum. This is where the linoleum was once was. It was ripped off and then whatever amendments were left were just sanded down on the belt sander that we have right here off camera outside. The panel is purposely cut to be oversized and that's so that once I mounted in place, I could go ahead and properly square everything off with, with a handheld belt sander. The reason why I did not, or I, the reason why I should say I left the extra material is because the hull isn't quite straight. It kind of bows and waddles here or there. So if I wanted to make it a perfect square cut, which obviously I could have done with my table saw or with my circular saw, it would have still left room for improvement. So by leaving the piece overscaled, this will then allow me to sand down just what needs to be sanded down, so everything will be nice and smooth once it comes time for the next following steps. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and fasten the panel to the vehicle. And this is going to be done with both adhesives as well as also with just proper fasteners. I'm gonna go ahead, drill some holes into this plate over here, add countersinks, and then I'll just bolt everything in place with the various bits of hardware I picked up from the hardware store. And after a few turns of a screwdriver, the bottom plate is now bolted to the lower portion of the vehicle. On the inside, you can see the fasteners. They have been Loctited in place. I am going to shorten them just, you know, for good measure. And then there's going to be another procedure that's going to be added after the unit is squared off that's going to preserve and, shall we say, solidify everything as one solid unit further. So to square it off, there's the correct way to do it, and then the, well, less correct way to do it. The correct way is to take a handheld belt sander, just go up and down the surfaces over here until the wood is removed and everything is nice and smooth. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have any belts for my handheld belt sander, and I'm not in the mood to run back out to town, so I'm just going to do it the less correct way, which is you could do it the same exact procedure, but using a angle grinder, and that's the way I'm going to be rolling. So. Let's see if I, or let's see what the end result of that's going to be.
Okay, not too bad. There's a small little gouge in the section over here, but that could easily be taken care of with some body work. So I'm just going to continue with the procedure and let's get back to when that's all taken care of. So one change that I made was to the back plate that you have here. As you can see, I plated it over with a brand new strip of wood. This was to make the piece a bit more cleaner. The thing is, if you add material here, this is going to extend the angle this way and it's going to look a little bit wonky. By adding a plate here, one, it gives the hull a more appropriate look. And the second thing is it's easier to flare it in in this type of a cut and it'll look appropriate as opposed to the other way around. So really you're getting your cake and eating it too. Also, with plating this over, this gets rid of that bowing section that we had in the center. And this was going to be, you know, plugged up with epoxies and other things. But with this plate covering it up, you can see how much flatter everything looks. So again, it's really for the best. The sides have been sanded smooth. So everything is squared away, or at least as good as it can be for now. I am going to be going over it again with a palm sander towards the next step. But before I do that, on the plate over here, this is just held in place with nothing but super glue. No more, no less. So I'm going to go ahead and add these three countersunk wood screws that I've just found loitering around my spare fastener bin. And these are going to be repurposed on this section over here. So teleporting us to the next morning, unfortunately for the next procedure I ran out of time yesterday and I'll be mentioning that in more depth in a moment. But here we have the lower hull with the wood taken care of as I mentioned before, but I also went ahead and extended the side sections right here with a little sliver of Lexan plastic. This is going to be all blended into the side of the hull and it's going to give the hull the appropriate lower length that it actually needs. Or I should say on the front. I am also going to take care of the rear, but that's going to be in the next video. So at this point here, the model is now ready to go into its next step. And this involves going back to the wood that we have here. So as you can see, I used wood for the fabrication of this component. However, it is not finished yet. And I'm just going to come out and say this is going to be, actually the next few topics I'm going to talk about are probably going to be very controversial to some people out there and it's going to probably piss some people off, but this is my channel and, uh, you know, that's how this cookie crumbles. I am not a fan of wood models. I never was, I never will be. Um, I appreciate the craftsmanship that goes into making models out of wood and there are lots of really uh, good benefits of using wood. It's affordable, it's very easy to work with, and it's very... Uh, it's a very forgiving material to work with and I use it myself for scratch builds when I, all my scratch builds are made out of quarter inch Luan. However, I do not leave it in this condition and I take it to the next step and so do most other people that do high-end wood models as well. If you look at those models out there that are just, you know, like mahogany or whatever, they're treated in some kind of a material, either varnish or linseed oil or what have you. But to just take wood, build something, and call it a day, that is just ridiculous. I will never do that, and it just doesn't look good ever. Wood is a bad material for some applications. And building an entire model out of one and leaving it in its El Natural material is definitely not the way to do so. And I, the reason why I say this is because I've seen a lot of people out there on YouTube, on many of the 160L Facebook groups, where they don't do that. Uh, they use baseboard and they just build and paint the model and call it a day. And that, in my opinion, is a lower end product. Um, the when you see a wooden model, you can tell it's made out of wood, right? You could see it. It you could see the wood grain through the paint. It's just it looks wood. It looks incomplete. And uh, there are some. There was a company for a while out in Asia, I think, that was making T thirty four eighty fives with three D printed parts, and the the tanks were very affordable and the reason why was because it was just baseboard painted green with the parts added to it and that's just unacceptable in my opinion um uh, in fact there's a another uh, uh vendor out there who is currently making i'm not gonna say the name and i'm not gonna say the vehicle type but they're making one six scale red controlled tanks out of wood and they use wood for everything untreated wood i might i might add for the hull the turret the gearbox even the running gear is wood, which is bafflingly ridiculous. That is a horrible, horrible method of 
of material for this application. And I know I'm gonna have some carpenter come in trying to experience, you know, brag, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years and depends on the trees. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I don't care what you say. Bro, I've been doing it probably just as long as you. I've been, you know, I have eyes. I've seen lots and lots and lots of builds out there using wood and I've used wood myself. And I, th these are the opinions that I have because of, of which. Wood is a terrible material that's left untreated because it's porous, it absorbs moisture, depending on the tree, of course, but regardless, they all eventually soak up moisture, they swell, and they are susceptible to rot. I just don't like this material. The only thing, in my opinion, that's worse than wood models are models made out of cardboard and styrofoam, and I'm pretty sure I pissed off some more people with that. So, <laughs> I'm going to be pissing off a lot of people with this video. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, as for wood for a gearbox, that's just crazy. Using wood for a sprocket, track, and wheels is just nuts. First, it looks nothing like the, the real one. It just doesn't. It, it, looks, it looks like a sore thumb. Second, I have worn out and broke metal track links driving in snow, driving in, uh, in the woods. And I even have a buddy of mine who has armor tags, lots of armor tags, and he wears out sprocket tooth rings. He swaps them out like the way a NASCAR driver swaps out tires, which is so, I don't, if you're watching this, I don't know how the hell you pull that one off. But regardless, we have occasionally run into these things with metal. Metal! Wood? Forget it. You're, you, if, if you're buying one of those models, bro, uh, you know, good luck. That's all I'm going to say is good luck with that. And specifically for a suspension, because you're talking about parts of the vehicle that are making contact with the ground, which is moist, it's got mud, it's wet. All of these things are just not conducive to wood, and I don't care what magical tree you're using, it's wood at the end of the day, and wood is just not a durable substance for that application. Back to what I have over here, so as you can see I'm not a fan of wood, but yet I utilize it on all of my scratch builds. Well, there's a reason, because the wood is treated. If you go ahead and treat the wood, changes the ball game entirely and the wood becomes more like a plastic substance as opposed to just natural you know wood fiber so to treat the wood the material that i'm going to use is something that i've been using for many many decades and also this technique is something that i've never shown on youtube in the past so this is going to be a first for the eca channel first for the material that i'm going to be coating the unit or the wood in Fiberglass resin. Fiberglass resin is a fantastic material in order to treat the wood surface. The fiberglass resin basically solves and alleviates almost all of those pesky shortcomings that I mentioned that this material does have. The other great thing about the fiberglass is that because the wood is porous, it actually soaks up the fiberglass resin and basically the wood becomes impregnated with it and once the resin sets the wood now has properties of plastic and no longer wood and this makes the material first weatherproof or much more weather resilient compared to just leaving it natural the material also gets in there and allows me to sand away all of the wood grain and basically the surface becomes like plastic and this is something that is very beneficial on a model like this. Another thing that I'm going to mention about the fiberglass is that I'm using just resin alone. And this is another point of contention that I'm sure I'm gonna piss off someone out there because I do not utilize cloth or the matting. This stuff here, I never utilize on my surfaces. And the reason is very simple. When you're building a model like this here, if you add any sort of cloth or any other type of matting to it, you're just going to have the effect of adding another layer on top of something and it's going to have the look of making the thing look bulbous and chunky and, if, and dimensionally it grows. And that is a problem specifically on a model. The last thing you want to do is have a bulbous thing that you have to sand and polish and it just makes it even more work that is not necessary. So I'm just going to use the, the resin alone, and this again is going to piss some people off. If you are going to go with the cloth, you could add on the inside, just like this model over here, and it's you know not a problem at all, totally different story. However, for me, I'm not going to use the, the matting or the cloth, I'm just rolling with the resin. And the resin is going to be applied to the outside as well as the inside. I like to thoroughly coat my surfaces with the fiberglass resin to make it as impregnated and as 
through, through and through soaked as possible. Again, I've had people in the past comment or you know tell me in person when I was at shows uh, when I tell them you know my my techniques. They're, you know a lot of these old boomer type uh, surfer dudes are like, dude, you know I used to build surfboards and and when you do it, you're only supposed to put on on the one side or also you know you want that thing to flex. Granted, for a surfboard, that's absolutely correct. Or, you know, so he claims. But for a model, not so much. I want the thing thoroughly soaked in and out with the fiberglass resin. You see, unlike a surfboard, these models here have internal structures, or generally the, the scratchable ones do. They have internal structures, and it's a box frame, and you have lots more rigidity. So the resin going in there, solidifying everything, the warpage is no longer going to be an issue, and the thing will not crack. Uh, and to, as a point of reference, I have, I'm looking right here in the shop, I have uh, a bunch of models here that are 25 plus years old now, and they're built with the same material, and there's not a single crack or chip or blister, nothing. They are just in the same exact condition as they were when they were first completed all those years ago. So fiberglass resin is the way to go. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that the wood is porous and it will soak up the fiberglass, so it basically acts similarly to the cloth. Uh, and on top of that, because this particular model here is made out of fiberglass, the resin is going to bond with it absolutely perfectly. So with my TED talk out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and take this thing outside and we're going to start with the fiberglass resin application. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to piss some people off with that too, because it's the internet and everyone gets pissed off about everything. So let's go ahead and start making people angry. With the model outdoors, you can see the various bits of equipment I'm going to be utilizing for the job. Of course we have the fiberglass. The fiberglass resin consists of the resin as well as a little bottle of hardener. Unlike my casting resin where it's a one-to-one -one mix, this stuff here it's a ratio mix so that's something that you know needs to be factored in. We have here a repurposed empty jug of apple juice but you could use milk as long as there's no milk or anything on the inside. It's nice and clean. Cut the top off. This is what I'm going to be using for the actual mix and pour. And I like to utilize a very high-tech expedient tool for the actual mixing. Yes, this is literally how I always do it. So, one thing about fiberglass resin is that you are on the clock. Fiberglass resin is a very, very fast setting mix. And it's one of those things where once it's mixed and it's active, it's go time. So you want to have all your ducks in a row and you want to have everything laid out and planned out before you actually, you know, do the application. The other thing about fiberglass resin, you'll notice I am wearing gloves. Of course, I'm wearing more than one pair. I'm actually wearing three pairs because this stuff is very, very abrasive and it will just eat through uh, latex gloves like a hot knife through butter, specifically once it starts setting. Two other important things you need for fiberglass resin are environmental. You need heat and you need sunshine being in the mid to late August period when I'm filming this, luckily I have an access of both. This definitely becomes a problem as the year goes on. We go into the armpit of the year where, you know, it's cold and snowy. So uh, you can't have one or the other and have a successful set, but if you don't have either, you're just going to have to postpone. Obviously, you live in California or Arizona. This is definitely not portraying to you. But here in the Northeast, yeah, this is a somewhat seasonal activity. Again, being the summertime, perfectly fine right now and the more heat and sun you have the faster the, st the stuff actually sets on the opposite note if you do not have either of those the stuff just will not set at all even if it's properly mixed I had uh, a situation happen years ago when I mixed in the middle of January and it stayed gooey for almost like a year and the stuff was properly mixed but it just didn't set it wasn't the right conditions for that. So bear that in mind when you're dealing with fiberglass resin. As I mentioned before, there's going to be a little bit of contention with some people out there, and it's going to be with the application. You'll notice I don't exactly have any brushes on the table, and how are you going to apply the, the fiberglass resin to the surface? Well, I'm going to be utilizing the most important development in human history in terms of tools. My hands. That's right. I'm using my hands for the application of the resin, which also necessitates why I have so many layers of latex on my hands. Uh, before I, I can already see people lining up in the comment section, you're supposed to use a sponge brush or a disposable brush. Use a brush, you idiot. Use a disposable brush. Um, I, you know, keep in mind, I've been doing 
I've been around fiberglass resin since I was eight years old, and I've seen all the techniques, and I've seen all the outcomes, and I've been personally mixing fiberglass resin since the age of 13. So I know about all those techniques, and the reason why I choose not to use them is for some very important reasons. First, with the foam brush. The, like I said before, this stuff is very uh, abrasive, and the foam will start decaying on you shortly after it starts setting. So then when you're doing the application, you're gonna have little crumbs of foam embedded into your surface that you're gonna have to sand away and makes the job a little bit more difficult. Similar is true for the brush. Those cheap brushes, not only do you have now brush hairs and that are embedded in the fiberglass, but now you also have, it, when it starts setting, it makes like a rake type appearance with the brush strokes. And again, it's not really beneficial. When I use my hands, I use require less layers, and it goes on in a much smoother way. Don't believe me? Literally look at all of my scratch builds on the YouTube channel. Namely, I'll just point out one. My uh, initial production, Tiger One, all Luan construction, all done with the fiberglass resin, all done with my hands, and, you know, get back to me on the surface uh, uh, texture on that. Okay, so... With that out of the way, let's go ahead and actually start the mix. I'm going to get this all on camera, and uh, again, once the stuff is mixed, you're on the clock. Also, in full disclosure, it's been about 10 years since I've actually mixed fiberglass resin. I just haven't had, you know, a build like this where it necessitated it. So, I'm a little rusty, but, you know, it's like riding a bike. Oh yeah, I definitely missed that smell. All right. Before anyone's wondering, the stick has been cleaned off too, so there's no mud or bark or anything like that in the, in, along those lines. Okay, so when you mix the fiberglass resin, it turns into this bluish hue color. That's how you know at that point there, you, you're activated. And you are essentially now on the clock. All right, here we go. So, pour it on. Time for the smear, just like so. Just smear it on in a somewhat smooth manner. In addition to smearing on the surfaces, when I'm on the edges, I'm also pushing it into the gaps where the two panels are intersecting each other. And oh yeah, that smell. Whew, I miss that smell. I love the smell of fiberglass resin in the morning. Remember, you gotta let it soak into the wood fibers, and it's doing that. There are some extra holes that I drilled in before when I was trying to figure out where the fasteners go. The reason why I, I changed my mind on some of those is because I will be having detail fasteners in these locations over here. And so I needed to revise that because it's obviously easier to drill new holes than it is to try to drill through a, a steel bolt. So. Okay, so I'm getting some drips, but that's perfectly fine. All that will be solved later. And that's basically how I do it. Note how smooth and clean everything is. There's no, there are no um, brush strokes or anything like that. If I get big puddles like that, I just scoop it up with my finger. I'm also using it to fill in the gaps over here where I glued on those pieces of Lexan. Those are just held onto the model at the moment with uh, just some super glue. I didn't put any fasteners in them at the moment. So I'm on the fence if I'm gonna do that or not. They are gonna get a row of fasteners on them for detailing as there's a row of fasteners that flange the transmission to the lower hull, but more than that's going to be discussed later on, or probably in another video when I get to that aspect of it. Okay, the gloves are wearing out, as you can see. All right, so I'm just going to dump the rest of it on top. Set this aside, let it dry. Okay, let's go ahead and get in here. I want to get those holes plugged up with the resin. 
nice and smooth. Nice and smooth. Also, another thing I want to mention at this time is that you, the countersinks are as flush as possible, or actually they're below the surface as possible, as I always mention in these videos. That is done strategically because it's easier to sand away bodywork material than it is to sand away a metal fastener. And when the thing is as absolutely flush, you will have difficulty getting rid of that little indication point where the two items are located. And that's something I do on my Armortech builds, and that's something that's true for basically every one of my builds. I always like doing that, for good measure. Okay, that is it. I'm looking at the sunlight to see if there's any thin areas. If there are, I will adjust accordingly. This is how it's done, just like this. All right, now, once it's as smooth as possible. Technically, I could have used a cake spatula for the same technique, but I don't have one on hand to waste, so I'm just gonna use my hands. Gloves are holding up pretty well with the triple layers. All right, that's it. Okay, it's the best I'm gonna be able to do at the, at the moment. So I'm just gonna go ahead and let it dry. All right, Mr. Sun, do what you gotta do. So jumping ahead a few hours and fiberglass is thoroughly dry. If I bring the camera in closer, you can see that the surface is absolutely smooth. And the wood grain is completely and utterly blended over. The hull is going to be going into sanding and refining in order to just smooth it out even further because right now it, there's ripples and and uh, waves, you know, because of the way it was smeared on. But regardless, this is much more easily addressed compared to the other techniques. And at this point here, the wood, at least on this side, is basically plastic. But I'm not done yet with the fiberglass. From here, I'm going to go ahead, flip it over, and I'm going to add some more onto the inside portion just to thoroughly get the inner area soaked with the resin, but also in a way to help fuse it with the hull. On this particular example here, because the model is made out of fiberglass, the resin is definitely going to bond with it much better compared to full rotomold mold or some other type of material. In addition to adding it to the wood, I'm also going to be adding it to the internal fasteners, just so, again, everything is as solid and as unified as possible.
because of the way the hull was warped, this allows me to just pour the rest on the inside and basically just tilt the body to one side or the other, which will allow the resin to flow onto the bare exposed areas of wood that are underneath. Oddly enough, since the resin was applied to the outer portions, it seals it from the area, so the resin has literally nowhere to go except for the place that it needs to. Seems I mix a little light, so I'm going to go ahead and mix a little bit more just so I could then coat all those fasteners on the inside. And then, well, from there, just set the thing aside, let it dry. All right. Practically no time, the resin is set, and the model is now effectively one piece. On the inside portion over here, I could have also taken some cloth and overlaid it, hit it with the resin, and that could have you know, uh, fused everything together even further. However, for the applications of this build here, that's really unnecessary. But, you know, in case you're wondering, yeah, technically you could have definitely have done that. Flipping the model back over, it's now time to get back, ooh, it's still warm from the <laughs> chemical reaction. Uh, it's now time to get back to the under hull texturing. So, although the resin has been applied and the and the wood grain has been eradicated and even the fasteners themselves have been by the most part entombed in the resin I still need to prep the surface with the way the resin is applied it is slightly uneven with the, the way it was smeared on a place like I referenced earlier so from here I'm gonna go ahead and start with the sanding process also another benefit of the sanding process is that it scuffs the surface up and makes it a better area to apply the detailing as well as also the layers of paint that are going to be added subsequently as the build goes on. But from this point here I'm just going to mask up, take out my palm sander and start with the polishing. So after the fiberglass resin is all set it's then time to begin with the bodywork and sanding refinements. So what you see here is actually the model halfway through the procedure. I was in the process of sanding everything down. I even added some spot putty or glazing putty to some of these sections over here to square everything off and also to just fill in any craters or any other type of imperfections. The green stuff you see is actually Evercoat. I utilize this stuff in the past. It's a two-part mix. It's very similar to the red glazing spot putty that I use for the multitude of my builds, but this stuff here dries a hell of a lot faster, but this is due in part because it's a two-part mix. This is the same stuff that I utilize on the 1-6 scale German tanks whenever I do Zemmer coating. It's the same exact stuff. As for the quality, it's actually really good stuff. This pouch over here looks pretty dingy because I actually found it in the grass right over there where it's overgrown. must have fell, fallen a year or two or maybe three ago, and I'm like, well, screw it. Let me go ahead and see if it still works, and behold, it still works along with the hardener that was also outside too. So, you know, it's good quality stuff. Excellent for this type of an application. For working on plastic models, not so much. But for large surfaces like this, it's a really, really, really good product. The sanding was done with the palm sander. I have here my Ryobi palm sander. I bought this a number of years ago specifically for tasks like this. Sadly, I don't get a chance to use it as much as I originally intended to. But regardless, I was in the process of sanding everything down. It was doing a really good job on this area over here, really making it nice and smooth. Unfortunately, while I was in the process of sanding, next thing I know, I hear some metallic grinding noises. As it turns out, the ball bearing that's on the inside here literally exploded, and the balls were all in the little bag. So that was something that was less than ideal. I went ahead and picked up another palm sander right here to replace it from Harbor Freight. This is a Hercules one. I'm gonna give this one a shot, see you know how this one pans out. But in the interim, I also went ahead and went and got the replacement parts required to get this guy up and running again. He's been repaired. So this guy here is back to full operation. So I'm going to be utilizing both of them for the, the duration of the sanding process. I'll probably use one for the, the more coarser sandpaper, and then I'll use the other one with the finer sandpaper just to really smooth everything over. With the camera readjusted to the rear section over here, you could really see I, I smeared on and packed on a lot of that 
putty in order to build this section up. As I mentioned before, this area is relevant because this is actually going to be viewable by the viewer, and this area here is going to be cut out so the flip grill could go into the section over here. So it would be nice to have it nice and squared away. You don't have that ugly weave that is present on the inside section here that is going to be, again, viewable to the viewer. So that's going to be sanded away with the palm sander. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and continue. But before I do, you can already see, let me tilt this guy upward, how the fasteners have been completely blended in and are just really submerged in the fiberglass resin. There is absolutely zero trace that the fasteners are there. And once everything is fully painted, it's just gonna look like one continuous panel on the bottom of the model. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue with the sanding process. I have two palm sanders now, so if one goes down, when I have replacement parts, I bought more than one ball bearing in case that happens again. And the second thing is, uh, you know, I have two, so I should definitely be able to complete the job. Before I do that, of course, I am gonna mask up. This stuff is nasty. You definitely don't wanna breathe this stuff in. So I'm gonna go ahead and wear the appropriate safety equipment. With the particles still in the air, I have to keep my mask on. However, you can really see how the bottom plate is really shaping up. It is basically as smooth as glass at this point over here. There are a divot or two that I can feel that could easily be taken care of with some red spot putty and then could be hand polished down with some sandpaper. But I think we are done with the palm sander for the bottom plate. I'm going to go ahead and change the pads because that's the sandpaper pad is worn out at this point, then I'll tackle the sides and the rear plate area.
lot of sanding. Okay, so with the palm sander, I was able to hit all of the flat areas and did a very good job with hitting all those extremities. However, this leads us to a point where I'm not gonna be able to use the palm sander anymore, and that's this inner area that we have here. As I referenced before, this is very important to get this area nice and squared away. So to do this, I'm gonna utilize a tool that's very specialized, and it's a tool that I haven't used in many, many, many years, and that is my Black & Decker Power File. The Power File is perfect because it has this nice, thin little belt over here, and I could carefully go in here and remove the amount of material necessary for the job at hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and mask up again. Let's go ahead and start with the removal process. Uh, one other thing I just wanna mention that right now my hands have the jitters from holding those palm sanders for as long as I have. Uh, that comes with the territory when you're doing long pronounced periods with palm sanders, your hands tend to get like the shake. So I'm gonna probably give it a little bit of a rest for the moment, take a quick break. And uh, hopefully, once my hands start feeling better, I'll be able to continue with the remainder of the process. From the bar. Well, that's just dandy. So I broke the belt that I had on here as we just saw. I know I have spare belts in the shop. No idea where the hell they are. So I went ahead and picked up some fresh ones off Amazon. They'll probably be coming in tomorrow. In the interim, I'm gonna go ahead and just start adding some more putty to certain areas that could use a third or tertiary coat. One would be the rear firewall over here. Just another smear should do the job. And there are some sections on the sponsors I do wanna hit as well, just to make it again level. Yeah, screw it, might as well. By the way, before anyone says anything, the reason why so much came out is because there's a little hole on the side of the tube. So yeah, that's why I use a little bit more hardener than I really need. So, but since it's out, it might as well mix it in anyway. The only thing that means that this stuff dries that much faster. Take two, a day or so later, and I got the replacement belt from Amazon. And well, I'm gonna mask up and continue exactly where I left off. All right, it's doing a real good job as I predicted, so I'm gonna continue with the procedure. Okay, so that did a really good job. There's some sections over here that could use a second coat of putty, but 
I'm really happy with the outcome so far. Just gonna clean up the side sections and then switch back to the palm sander to take care of the remainder of the side section. One other thing that I didn't really show in the previous scene is I went ahead and added a coat of red putty to several of the areas, which only need just a fine top coat of putty applied. So that's why I went with this material instead of the other stuff. Regardless, I'm going to go ahead and sand it down. So here's the lower hull with the sanding out of the way. The palm sander and the power file did a fantastic job doing the procedure. From this point onward, I'm going to clean up this area over here. This needs to be a nice straight cut line, but we have some over smudge from the putty and that's going to be cleaned up with the Multimax. The oscillator is just go in here and just carefully trim away the unwanted material. On the back over here, this is going to get a second coat of red putty. And I could sand it in by hand. I don't need to use any machines for that. And uh, with the exception of maybe one or two small little spots that are again done with red putty and hand sanding, this is basically ready to go. I am going to go ahead and add some more body filler to the sponsons over here, making them nice and straight. With the way the kit is, you can see it's a bit on the, I don't want to say deformed end, but you could see that it bends inward over here. I guess that was due to the molding. So that's something I'm going to address when I get the actual putty in hand, I ran out and I had to order some more off Amazon. So that should be coming in shortly. But once that's in, I could then progress further. So before I could continue any further, what I am going to do is I am going to clean the surfaces off because this thing is a dusty mess. Not just the tank, but also myself. Literally, I have so much dust on me that when I saw myself in the mirror, I look like... To get the dust off, that's actually probably one of the funner parts to do. Just hit it with a garden hose. No more, absolutely no less. With the weather I have right now, it's definitely a viable option. So cleaning the model surface does have lots of benefits to it. First, it just makes the model safer to be around. This particulate here can easily become airborne, and if it does, it's definitely not something you want in your lungs. The model is clean, so I don't have to worry about making a bigger mess in the shop. And the other benefit is that the surfaces if it has a lot of powder on it, it may interfere with the next layers of filler and putty that need to be added in order to take it from this point onward. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and start with the rinse. You notice I am going with a light, soft mist at this point here. There's a reason for that. The water in this type of format is going to fall very softly onto the powder and this will have the effect of trapping the powder and it will prevent it from making it airborne. Once the thing is 
pre-soaked like that, then I could just go with a stream and take care of the rest. That's a little bit of a trick you don't exactly see in most places. You could also use an air gun to just blow the stuff clean if you have compressed air. That's something I have done in the past and you know, I do often, but because I have the nice bright shiny and very hot weather, it's definitely conducive for the, uh, the washing trick. If this was in the middle of the winter time, yeah, I'd probably more likely use the air compressor. The air compressor does work, but it doesn't do nearly as good of a job as the water does for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Okay, so this thing should dry in practically no time with this nice, beautifully warm September sun that we have right now. And on top of that, because the wood, of course, is thoroughly coated inside and out with fiberglass resin, it is going to protect the wood from the potential damage that can happen with the water. Once the body is fully dried off, it's then time to continue with the next layers of the bodywork. Here you can see that I used my red glazing and spot putty on a few certain locations. This was to address some very small superficial surface imperfections that need to be polished away at this time. The difference between the other bodywork methods and this one is with the other ones I use the palm sander to take care of the sanding work, but for these since they are so precise, this is all going to be done and taken care of by hand. A few swipes here and there should be more than enough to do the job that's necessary. Same is true for the rear area over here. You can see where the putty was added. This is just going to be polished away very quickly when the time comes. On the inner area, this too has a nice smear of the red putty. This is again to blend in all of these surfaces over here from the previous procedure as it did a fantastic job, but you know, it did leave a small imperfection here or there. And with this stuff now added, I could thoroughly blend everything so it's nice and smooth. The one area, if you notice, I'm not paying any attention to is this little chunk that we have right here. And this is because with the way the Sherman is designed, I will have these little extenders added to these sections over here. And not only will they connect and extend the lower hull, but there's also another plate that secures and blocks this section off, just like it does on the real vehicle. Because of that, this area here is basically superfluous and getting and spending time on taking care of the bodywork and making sure this area is nice and smooth is really not necessary. As for these sections over here, well, I'll go into more information about that in the next video update. The very last thing I want to mention involves the model sponsons. Like I mentioned before, and as you probably have saw before with the various camera angles, that this section here is far from straight. And for most builders out there, it's not, it's actually a non-issue and you can actually build the model and this will have absolutely no effect on the final outcome. But for me, I do want to cover my bases specifically at this time of the build. You know, I have the opportunity to, to take care of it. So I might as well just go ahead and take care of it at this point. Regardless, in order to do this procedure, I needed some more of that green filler stuff. And sadly, I ran out. So I did place an order for some more. It's still on the way. As soon as it comes in, I'll be able to pick up exactly where I left off. So that's another thing that's going to be mentioned in the next video update. From here, there's really nothing more I can do until the red putty here fully sets, as well as when the new compound comes in, so I can continue exactly where I left off. And... Of course, I'll be taking everyone along for the ride, and you'll see the thing progress further from this point onward. And, well, now it's actually the perfect point to end off this video, not just because of that, but I am currently standing outside, and there is a literal cloud of gnats hanging around me and the camera. So hopefully I don't hear any annoying buzzing when I'm editing this video. And with that, that is the perfect point to sign off on this project update video for this 1-6 scale M4A3 E2 Jumbo Sherman tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content, being 1-6 scale project update videos like this guy over here, or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop new posts of content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.